Thank you so much to Haymarket Books and to John. We're so pleased to be co-hosting this program with you today. I'd like to welcome everybody to today's panel and discussion, which we're very much looking forward to. My name is Nina Mehta. I'm co-director at Parseo, together with Donna Neville, who I'm very appreciative to for conceiving of today's program, and who I'm also grateful to be sharing a vision, commitments, work, care, along with our other Parseo team members and collaborators. Parseo's work is rooted in principles of participatory action research and popular education, which honors values and is centered in the community's own knowledge, wisdom, and experience. We partner with organizations, community groups, universities, and a range of institutions seeking to strengthen their work for justice in so many creative and meaningful ways. We look forward in this discussion to considering the power and the impact of community-generated research, education, and knowledge creation in our work for justice. And we're so appreciative to have such wonderful individuals and groups with us that really embody those commitments. This work is necessarily grounded in anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist frameworks that are truly liberatory and that challenge all forms of injustice. We're very aware of the current moment in Palestine Along with the powerful protests and resistance in Palestine and across the globe, we've also seen beautiful community generated and shared information, knowledge, and stories that are rooted in the histories, lives, and experiences of the Palestinian people. Today, as we think about our work for justice, we collectively imagine new forms of resistance and engagement as we continue to build community. And we do this in multiple ways and contexts to create communities in which together we can understand and challenge unjust systems. We can organize for and envision expansively and with great commitment and creativity a just world, locally, across borders, and globally. Uh, I'd like to now introduce the speakers and tell you a bit about them. You'll hear more about their amazing groups directly from each of them. Tamara Ben Halim is a British Palestinian Libyan and the director and co-founder of Makan. She has worked in Arab civil society for over a decade, co-founding and leading the international initiative Cycling for Gaza and working with Arab venture philanthropy organization Alfanar. Tamara holds a first class master's of science in human rights from the London School of Economics and a master's in modern European languages from the University of Edinburgh. Darakshan Raja is the founder, co-director of Justice for Muslims Collective. She also serves on the board of trustees for the Consumer Health Foundation. Previously, Darakshan worked at the Urban Institute's Justice Policy Center for four years on a range of projects focused on evaluating interventions for victims of sexual assault for state and federal government agencies. Darakshan holds a master's in forensic psychology from John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Linda Carty, co-creator of the Feminist Freedom Warriors Digital Video Archive and founding member of the Democratizing Knowledge Project, is a Black feminist scholar activist and educator in the African American Studies Department at Syracuse University. Linda's feminist activism, research, scholarship, and teaching spans transnational Black feminist theory and anti-capitalist education and Black women's labor struggles, migration and sexuality in Canada, the Caribbean, and the U.S. She is author, among other books, of A Genealogy of Marxist Feminism in Canada and Not a Nanny, a Gendered Transnational Analysis of Caribbean Domestic Workers in New York City and is editor of the anthology And Still We Rise, Feminist Mobilization in Contemporary Canada. She's also published many activist writings, the most recent being, Will a State Ever Acknowledge Domestic Violence in St. Kitts Nevis as Needing Its Attention? Linda works with a number of national and international organizations, including community-based rehabilitation in the Caribbean. Chandra Talpadi Talpadi Mohanty is the co-creator of the Feminist Freedom Warriors Digital Video Archive and founding member of the Democratizing Knowledge Project. She teaches women's and gender studies at Syracuse University. Her work focuses on transnational feminist theory, anti-capitalist feminist praxis, anti-racist education, and the politics of knowledge. 
She is the author, among other books, of Feminism Without Borders, Decolonizing Theory, Practicing Solidarity, and Feminist Genealogies, and co-editor of several volumes, including Third World Women and the Politics of Feminism, Feminist Gene Genealogies, Colonial Legacies, Dem Democratic Futures, and Feminism and War, Challenging U.S. Imperialism. Chandra has taught at universities in Europe, Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and is a, a steering committee, committee member of the Municipal Services Project, is co-principal investigator of the Democratizing Knowledge Summer Institute, and a coordinating team member of the Future of Minority Studies Research Project. Chandra was a member of the Indigenous and Feminist of Color Solidarity Delegation to Palestine in 2011, She's a member of the advisory boards of numerous journals and organizations. Uh, before we get started, I also wanted to remind everyone to like and to share the video so that more people can see it. So now let's get started. I'd like to begin by asking the, particip the participants if you can each share with us a little background about your organization and how you think about and conceptualize community. What do you mean when you talk about community? Tamara, can you please begin? Yes, thank you, Nina. Um, thanks to Perseo and to Haymarket. And um, it's great to be in such wonderful company um, today. So, um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, the organization I'm representing here today, McCann, which I'm um, a co-founder and director of. Um, in terms of background, uh, McCann is a Palestinian-led organization, and I mention that because I think there's quite a scarcity of Palestinian-led organizations in the field of Palestine, surprisingly or unsurprisingly. We can talk more about that later. Um, and we're really focused on uh, education, on political education, and on building the capacities of people within the Palestine movement, but also those allied uh, with, with the movement. Um, what McCann is really focused on and what we realized there was kind of a, a, a gap that needed to be filled um, in terms of uh, Palestine activism and solidarity work, uh, certainly in the UK, is, uh, you know, equipping activists who are already passionate about the Palestinian cause and, and who already feel close to it um, with the, the knowledge um, and the communication skills and the tools and most importantly, I think the confidence to be able to do their work as effectively as possible. Um, so I think there really is a sense of um, uh, trying to help people to empower themselves um, to be able to be kind of the most effective activists and advocates um, for freedom, justice and equality for Palestinians and for all people um, experiencing uh, oppression around the world. Um, so this takes the form of um, educational programs, so workshops, trainings that we tailor to specific, to the needs of specific groups of people, um, virtual talks, um, which we used to run at universities in London, but are now online, uh, which is one of the few perks of the COVID era, um, and generally kind of generating a lot of educational resources that our wonderful researchers um, produce, uh, and that we try to make available and accessible to as many people as possible, so that people with Within the movement um, can take these tools and use them to um, uh, strengthen and amplify their their own work. Uh, so that's that's a little bit the background on uh, McCann. Um, in terms of what uh, community uh, means for me or for us, so that I don't want to speak on anyone's behalf. Um, I think, you know, a big part of what we do, um, we've realized over the years, is to create safe spaces for people to learn. So it's not just about creating educational spaces, it's about creating safe spaces because there are very few safe spaces for people who can come as their full selves, whether they're Palestinians or allied with the Palestine movement or people who work in social justice. Um, the spaces that exist to talk about uh, Middle Eastern history on university campuses, for example, are not safe spaces for Palestinians. They're not places where um, we can talk about uh, the experience that Palestinians actually go through in terms of, have been through in terms of ethnic cleansing and settler colonialism and apartheid and dispossession. These are not conversations that are welcome um, or that are even kind of enabled or encouraged in any way in most university and academic spaces um, in the UK. 
Um, and I think that's also true um, for the United States, although hopefully that's um, starting starting to change a little bit. Um, so really a big part of what we do is to create those safe spaces for people not only to learn, but to share, to exchange and, and connect with one another. So I think for me, uh, that sense of community is kind of a safe space to build uh, and to build through numbers, because after all, I mean, you know, you're nothing without the collective. Um, so um, that's about it. And the last thing I'll say is that, um, you know, these are spaces that we wish we had when we were younger activists, um, places that were, uh, you know, that would be open to welcoming us. And makan means place in Arabic. So it's very much about creating that, that sense of metaphorical and physical place. Thank you, Tamara. That really resonates. Darakshan, um, you can go next, please. Sure. Um, thank you so much for having me. So in terms of the story of Justice for Muslims Collective, you know, the vision for it really comes from wanting to have a platform in a space led by predominantly Muslim women and those at the margins of the Muslim communities, where we can be far more radical in our vision, our political vision for our communities, in terms of really separating ourselves from organizations that have pushed an assimilationist political agenda. And so us being sort of rooted within the DC area where there are many national organizations that dictate civil, you know, sort of the, the policy priorities of our communities, how we engage with the government, and often that has come at the cost of invisibilizing women in our communities, issues that are, you know, civil rights and gender justice are seen as separate, even though they're deeply integrated and intertwined. So the vision for JMC really came from a place of centering that leadership, building a base of Muslims, in particular, the leadership of Muslim women um, to organize against state violence. And so, you know, our mission is very much about dismantling structural and institutionalized forms of Islamophobia. And we do it through political political education narrative shifting. We threw it, uh, do it through community empowerment and organizing and our healing justice program. And third, we also do a lot of partnership work at the national level as well as the local level. The work I'm gonna talk about here today really is, is that so much of the modes of our community organizing and leadership development work is all about building analysis based upon experience of folks. So we are not here to dictate theory to community, but rather we take an approach of here are the, the working definitions of structural or gendered Islamophobia. Let's as a collective of leaders actually put in our feedback into it. What are some gaps in these definitions? Because at the end of the day, the political education, the analysis, the theory is all actually about letting us do the work to build strong campaigns, right? It's about power building. It's about shifting the material conditions of our people. And so we really think about knowledge as like knowledge generation from one, folks who are at the toughest margins who are being impacted and from them learning about what is the what, what are the problems? How do we define these problems? How do we prioritize agendas? And so, so much of our research, if you really look at it, is all about like from the experiences of folks who are struggling through COVID night right now, for example, how are the intersections of COVID-19, working class Muslims, those who are refugees, asylum seekers, Islamophobia, like how are all of these intersecting with one another? Because again, for us, it's not about reading an article for the sake of just knowledge to say how brilliant people are. It's really Really about how do we actually materially use this to build the work that we do. So that's some of the work that um, we've been leading and I would love to talk later about our oral history projects that we're currently doing to also build community centered narratives. So the stories of Muslim workers who are labor union leaders. I mean, how many times do you hear about that narrative about Muslim communities? We're also engaging in a really robust 9-11 um, oral history project that is going to document stories from organizers in the community who have resisted and fought. Again, how do we build narratives that are really community centered and led by the community, but also in service to the community and not necessarily just some ivory tower where you can say you published X, Y, and Z, right? And so that's the work that we do. And that's what I'm really excited about being here to share about in terms of your question of what, who is community for us. For JMC, our community is our, you know, our leaders, our like organizers and our folks in the DMV region. <laughs> Thank you. It's brilliant. All right, Linda, please. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about the Feminist Freedom Warriors Project that um, Chandra and I put together. 
and how we came up with this and what it looks like now. And later on, we'll show you a video clip of a part of it and how we conceptualize community. Um, Linda, should I, should I start with how the two of us got together? Oh, or maybe that's a better, in, yeah. Okay. Let me do that, okay? This, this will contextualize the project. Yes. So um, Linda and I met actually at the International Feminist Book Fair in Montreal in 1988, which is a long time ago. And we've actually been uh, working together and apart in similar anti-imperialist feminist communities in the 1980s and the 1990s. So we've been working, you know, at the edge of each other's uh, spaces, across geographies and institutions. But since 2004, we've both been together at Syracuse University. And so in fact, that being together in that same space, right, we have been able to materialize some of the work that we've done over decades, separately and together. And so actually what we were going to do today um, is to talk about these two projects that we initiated and um, are very proud of. And um, we think, you know, really represent some of the very deep connections we've had to the feminist communities that each of us has been a part of, right? So, Linda, you want to go with a fem, or should I go with the DK first because it's the earlier one? Yeah, do DK first, right? So, so you know, um, the Democratizing Knowledge Collective at Syracuse was founded over a decade ago by a group of scholar activists from African-American studies, women and gender studies, Latino, Latin American studies, and LGBT studies, right? So you can see where we are all situated in higher education, always at the margins, but doing, we thought, extremely crucial work, right? And we, we kind of figured that a lot of the work we were doing, a lot of the knowledges we were producing were marginalized, but needed to be really centered in the institution as a whole for anybody interested in any kind of racial, economic, social justice. So some of us from that those early days are still in the collective. But now, and now, it is also still an interdisciplinary, multiracial collective of faculty and graduate students. We see ourselves as scholar activists devoted to decolonizing and democratizing racial, gender, colonial, and class hierarchies in higher education. So I have to say that we chose the term democratizing very deliberately, although we really mean decolonizing. But choosing the term democratizing was a political um, strategy to, to mobilize a larger uh, sort of space for the work we're doing and to be able to get some funding. Um, so the current members of the collective include Paula Johnson from the Law School, Jackie Orr from the Maxwell School of Social Sciences, Delarice Jackson from the School of Education, and Linda, um, Pedro Di Pietro, Himika Bhattacharya, and myself from the College of Arts and Sciences. So that's our small collective, right? When we talk about democratizing knowledge, we're referring to building awareness and recognition of the fact that there ought to be no hierarchical st structuring to knowledge production. So we want to transform the process of teaching and learning in higher education to be more representative of and relevant to what it ta what takes place in the social world in which we live, which as you know, we have inherited many colonial legacies and hierarchies that we have to engage with. Um, we stage conversations, we stage teachings, lectures, dialogues, and institutes, right, to take, to challenge the taken for granted structures by which all else is judged within higher education. So one, we, these are what we challenge. 
the structures that locate white privilege and white supremacy as the standard by which all else is ju judged, give men and their ways of knowing and thinking in the world priority always over anything that women and women or gender queer people have to offer, ascribe heterosexuality the power of normalcy, thus judging any other form of sexual orientation as deviant, and finally, ignore the legacies and negative impact on most of the world of empire building that on, on most of the world of empire building that have rendered entire folks subordinate and inferior. So I'll say two words about what community means then in this context, right? So um, we work to build real connections and solidarities across disciplines and across the borders of the academy, right? Um, so we envision community in multiple ways, I think. Communities of scholar activists, of teachers, of organizers, of political educators, all committed to challenging and destabilizing the, the kind of hierarchies of knowledge production, right? We work to foreground the ethics and politics of knowledge production in communities dedicated to race, gender, and economic justice. And we believe that significant and necessary knowledge resides in communities historically marginalized in space, in academic spaces, and that these communities, and this is very similar to what both Tamara and Darakshan has said, I think, that in communities historically marginalized, at, that these communities have epistemic insights that are crucial in dismantling power and envisioning just societies. All right, Linda. So it's um, in that context that we created um, Feminist Freedom Warriors. So how did this come about? In 2014, this is a decade after Chandra came to SU. And um, no, that's six years after Chandra came to SU and a decade after I was there. That um, we decided to send out a questionnaire to roughly 60 colleagues and friends, we knew them all uh, from the work that we had done in the past in different institutions and spaces and communities. And we asked four questions, all um, trying to get to, they were all scholar activists in the transnational feminist context where we had been living our lives but not documenting our collective experiences. The questions covered themes such as genealogies of feminist engagement in the academy and outside, contextualizing feminist activism as a challenge in the neoliberal academy, creating feminist spaces that we inhabit to claim our genealogies, and the meaning of solidarity across nation states in the global south and in the north, where we are. We're from the south, we're in the north. We, in, we sent out these surveys and um, we got about a 70% return. And we turned that into an article because um, the Oxford Handbook of Transnational Feminist Movement, those authors knew us and we knew them. And they asked if we would contribute a chapter to this collection that they were putting together. And so this survey turned into that chapter. And the title of it is Mapping Transnational Feminist Engagements, Neoliberalism and the Politics of Solidarity, which came out in 2014. The piece, that piece is about feminist community that we envision, especially for younger generations who have no relationship with the women that we um, spoke to in the survey and who are part of Feminist Freedom Warriors now. And so we wanted those younger women across these generations to understand that history that preceded them that they are very much excited about the work they're doing, but only knew these women from their written work. Yeah, So it's bringing them in touch with these elders. And that for us is a significant community that Feminist Freedom Warriors has now created. After writing the piece, as I said, we recognized that we had a great deal of data, rich data left over. And in thinking what to do with it, we decided that it would be good to put this material together as a project to share our genealogies, but more than that, we wanted, as I said, to get this across generations. 
We initially thought that it would be a good teaching tool, and it has turned out to be because we have heard from many colleagues and friends around the world of how they use this. I was telling Chandra yesterday that um, I have a friend in Grenada who said she's not a professor or even in the academy, and she does a lot of community work, and she has been taking segments of these clips to educate the women that she works with about the kinds of things that can happen from thinking of themselves as feminists or women who want to change their environment. So Feminist Freedom Warriors is the first of its kind digital video archive project that uses oral history to document the lives and work of feminist scholar activists of the latter 20th century to the present. It does more than tells these stories, however. It offers the actual praxis of feminists whose ideas, words, actions, and visions of economic and social justice have inspired us to document their challenges to the long history of institutionalized inequities. So what do we call community? It is that arc from in the north to the south, from the south to the north. And that we work together really closely. We are in touch with each other on different levels, whether we do it together collectively as, you know, maybe an element like DK or many of the organizations that we all belong to individually. That's our community. It is significantly transnational. All right, can't tell you anymore. Thank you, Linda and Chandra. You model community and community that disrupts and dismantles oppressive structures on so many levels. Uh, really, thank you, everybody. Uh, the next question, as we continue to think about community, what are the different ways you think about building community or communities and actually do build community? And why or how is that important to your work? Also, how do you think about the relationships between and among the different communities you are part of, whether it be university and activist or young and old or different communities engaging in struggles for justice? Tamara, can you please start us off again? Thanks, Nina. Um, yeah, I mean, I think just building on some of what I was talking about before, and it's so wonderful to hear all the many different angles and the richness here about, you know, how people practice community, how everyone practices community in their various kind of fields of work, and it's super um, inspirational. I think um, going back to the original, the earlier point I was making about trying to create, you know, educational spaces that are non-judgmental that are inclusive and that lift people up as opposed to kind of you know potentially doing the opposite um i think a big part of you know building community again is about creating spaces where people can bring their full selves i think for people working in social justice broadly, not just on Palestine, um, you know, where there have been historic and present, you know, attempts to uh, crack down on those um, movements and efforts in various ways, whether it's through surveillance, whether it's through policing thought and freedom of expression, um, whether it's through smear campaigns, there's so many different kind of tactics that have been used. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're so used to kind of internalizing that. And, um, and, you know, I, I can say that even for myself as a, as a Palestinian, you know, that, you know, you, you start to fall into the trap of policing yourself and your own thoughts. And of course, there's a huge danger to this because without articulating and expressing your thoughts at some point, you'll stop thinking them. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I guess that that's how kind of, um, things work in in fascist countries and in, and in true dictatorships is that you know you you stop people from saying things and eventually you stop them from from thinking them so um so i think you know i see the work that we do and actually i, I didn't think about it this way until until i was preparing for this talk the work that we do and the work that so many others do across across movements um of you know facilitating really just facilitating conversations and encouraging people to express, to share, to build on concepts and ideas. I mean, that work in itself, I think, is, you know, a small revolution. Um, it's doing that critical work. It's putting together those building blocks towards achieving justice. 
um, whatever that might look like. So, um, and then I want to just talk briefly about kind of a specific example more recently in this whirlwind of the last um, few weeks uh, since, you know, um, what is the daily violence that Palestinians experience kind of spilled over into kind of a, a, a bigger manifestation than, than, than usual, um, but by, by no means something uh, that they don't already experience on a day-to-day -day basis, um, is that, you know, we were finding as, again, as a largely Palestinian-led uh, team, of course, we have brilliant, brilliant team members from across the board, um, but as a largely Palestinian-led team, we were really struggling, and of course we are, um, you know, both as people who are um, bringing ourselves to work, but as people who are also, you know, activists or organizers or, um, you know, advocates outside of our of our own work, people who want to be able to, to be on the streets and protesting and, you know, living and breathing every, the whole moment that's been happening in the last two or three weeks. And, um, I certainly found, and I think that other team members at McCann also found, that the, one of the few things that helped us was to come together, even if it was in a virtual space, you know, every couple of mornings, and just check in with each other and, you know, literally be like, how are you doing? How are you feeling? You know, what's going on? What's happening on the ground? How's family? How are friends? And, you know, things, and, and this was so, um, it sounds so basic and so obvious, but it's not something that we do that much, especially because we're not in a, in an office, in a physical office together. And, and, you know, we realized that if this is the one thing that's helping us, then maybe this is something that we need to make available to others in our community. And so for the first time, instead of just organizing a space for the purpose of education, uh, we, we tried something new, which was to create a space just for community and just for pause, you know, just to take pause and reflect and to, and to process together. Um, and it was amazing, you know, it was, um, it was difficult, like on a personal level for everyone to be there, but um, people, really, I think, got a lot from it. And, you know, I certainly came out feeling like just a little bit lighter and just a bit more of a sense of relief. And I think the word, the word for that is healing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that was just a really big eye opener. And um, the last, I think, year, uh, for whatever reason, has also kind of awakened us to realizing that, you know, whether we're Palestinians or not, I mean, because so many of our allies are also folks from, you know, marginalized um, and and oppressed, uh, traditionally oppressed communities that, um, you know, we, we carry a lot of individual and collective trauma with us and that there need that needs to be respected and acknowledged and a space needs to be created for that. Um, and so it's about having that realization that uh, community plays such a crucial role in helping people to come together and to process that and to keep building and keep moving, but also to take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That is so important. But Akshan, can you please keep us going? Sure. Um, second, everything that Tamara mentioned, I, I was just listening to you, Tamara, and I was thinking about the work that we do at JMC. And um, one of our core programs in building community is our healing justice work. And so we have uh, a Muslim woman who is a chaplain. Um, and every single month, we hold healing sessions with the community. And it's been one of the most beautiful parts of our work, because I think sometimes in movement work, we can get um, so hyper productive and so much about the trauma and like, let's do a campaign, let's do organizing. And we've seen our folks burn out. Uh, it's not sustainable. While trauma, historical trauma, collective trauma could be a place of building shared identity, it is not a sustainable source of being able to move through, right? This work is going to take decades and decades. It's not something that's one and done. And so I think about how much our community, especially during COVID, when right all about like capitalism colonialism like all these violences have been about disrupting community it's been about ripping us apart from our communities and and in addition to that gender-based violence given we have such a space of muslim women i mean gender-based violence strips you of your family and your community as well and so we have people who have very 
traumatic experiences to your their own communities. And so then building a space around movement visions and political visions, I think that like it's there's a lot of care work and like mothering work and nurturing work that goes into it. Um, it's not just one simple one and done, right? Uh, one of the things I really miss is the in-person gatherings that we had. I think in our cultures, like food and joy and dance and art, all of that really is central to building community too, because again, I do think that like, while again, our pains and our traumas are a way that we can connect with each other, they are not a source of sustainability for the long run. And so at JMC, I consistently think about how do we continue to build community around like visions of liberation that feel moving and feel joyful and not just the the horrendous impacts of state violence on our communities, which can get very, very heavy over time. So that's what I would say in terms of our building. Community is central to power building, to organizing. Um, that's what you need. Um, and you have to meet community where people are at. I think sometimes if you come to try to force certain things on community, it's not going to go well either. So it's a real kind of a, a non-hierarchical relationship because there is input on both sides. So that's what I would say about um, community and hope that we can continue to integrate joy, healing justice, visions, um, all the beautiful things that can keep us together and not just the pain and the trauma uh, that we have in our communities. Thank you so much. Chandra, can you please go next? Well, I, I will maybe I'll, I'll say a couple things uh, before I turn it to Linda to talk a little bit about DK. Um, and we want to show you a five minute clip from the Feminist Freedom Warriors site just um, to to for people to get a taste of how we're envisioning feminist community. But I wanted to say that listening to Tamara and to Darakshan. And in terms of the way I think Linda and I and people I work with think about community. So community is not something that is just given. That community is something that we are actually building, right? So, um, and, and the way always we build on, it. Uh, and the way always we build, ongoing, yeah. Sorry, yeah. That we're building and it is a very uh, concrete kind of political understanding of community that involves things like care work, like affective relationships, right? And um, education as well. Okay, so I think that that to me is in, in some ways really significant in terms of what feminist community in fact means. Okay, that, that, that those are the layers of work that we all seem to do to create that. So when Tamara talks about safe space, it is a very politicized understanding of safe space. It isn't that we are going to separate ourselves from the you know, people who are engaging in violence in order to feel safe. It's much more than that. So I just wanted to say that, that I really appreciated that about what each of you mm -hmm. said. You know? And um, so Linda. Uh, yeah, I find this discussion really you know, intriguing because oftentimes we think that community is something that we may be part of or something we want to be part of or something we're building, but it's more or less outside of us, right? right. So what we're thinking is that, for example, Chandra and I do this work together in an academic context that has, in one part of it, has reached international, transnational very broadly. At the same time, we both individually belong to a number of organizations where we do activist, engaged activist work, which are different kinds of communities, but are in solidarity with this, these communities that we're building, that we envision inside of you know, the institutional structures. So it's really kind of striking. And, and as I listened to Tamara and Darakshan, I felt the same thing. Yeah, what is safe and what is not safe? Well, inside of the so-called safe institutional spaces, many of us always feel unsafe. And like Darakshan says, it can be based on language. It could be based on what you can't say. It can be based on knowing the, you know, the parameters within which you have to work, knowing the borders that you cannot traverse. This is all about physical, intellectual, and you know, emotional safety. 
So we are talking about all of that in these communities. When we look at um, DK, for example, it is all about justice work. These two projects that we're talking about are both about justice, justice work. DK is about justice work inside of the academy and its impact outside. How relevant are the institutions that we are part of to the communities of which they are part? For example, a big question that we ask in DK and SU is, is this education for the public good? Or are we just here as another kind of faction inside of the academy that, you know, in these protective walls of elitism? Or are we interested in having an impact in the community where the institution is located? Yeah. Linda, we have to move apparently to the video. Oh, oh time sorry. Nina. So wrap up I was looking at Nina. Yeah. Time, time's yeah. up. Yeah. We'll come back. Yeah. So we'll just run this video now, if that's okay. This is the FFW. People still think that capitalism is democracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, when you got those kind of thoughts, and people don't realize, you know, I mean, what someone has to be exploited for other people to make something. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so and then. You can't, you know, it can't be single issue politics. Single issue That's politics right. never gotten anywhere. That's right. mm -hmm. So you've got to approach it from the angle, uh, a multiplicity of angles. Today, when people refer uh, to intersectionality as if that category had always been around, mm -hmm. right. it's been so completely naturalized mm -hmm. now that uh, they don't take into consideration that uh, much of the impetus for developing a framework that was capable of addressing these issues together came directly from um, people, women especially, uh, working on the ground, doing activism mm -hmm. against war, mm -hmm. uh, uh, activism within the labor movement, uh, activism against, uh, for example, sterilization abuse. Mm -hmm. And why do we make organizations? We make them to do more than what we ourselves can mm -hmm. do as individuals. Mm -hmm. right. So I think um, it's only collective action that really can make change, one. And in terms of what we've been able to do, I think we have always confronted one particular major challenge um, that comes from living in an unjust and unequal system. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the, you know, our movements have those challenges mm -hmm. within them because we people are formed mm -hmm. in those environments. Mm -hmm. And so within movements is where we have to change ourselves mm -hmm. as well as achieve things for women. The real struggle is for consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. But as that is given to us out of mm -hmm. The material moment, mm -hmm. right. how to claim it and hold on to it with mm -hmm. each other. Now I think that's that 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 the new def that that a new kind of family is only going to come about as part of mm -hmm. an anti-capitalist struggle, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that. Only then would it will it really truly be you know love makes a family mm -hmm. families by mm -hmm. choice because everything that is weighted down on the family now that is forced upon the family survival mm -hmm. you know the buffer against utter destitution mm -hmm. you know that would be lifted from right the family mm -hmm. yeah and then there would be and then it would be a whole different life for women. And then also, what is the responsibility of white women within um, the different women's um, movements? Because we don't have a unified mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. what, what really is our role in um, trying to negotiate an, an, um, an honest coalition that, for me, asks more than for me to be an ally? Mm -hmm you know, for me mm -hmm. to be a, an active participant in, in the struggle, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. And I feel that another challenge now is that I feel that with many of these decolonial um, critiques to ourselves as intellectuals, mm -hmm. one issue is that my truth as a feminist of what is emancipation mm -hmm. and what is justice is not necessarily what they imagine or they want. Mm -hmm. 
So to arrive to the space of encounter opened to a dialogue in which I am willing to destabilize my certainties is not as powerful as arriving with the truth. Mm -hmm. Of course. It's a lot easier to get that with the truth than to get there and say, well, I just want to see what can we build. It seems yeah. to me that we really need yeah. to figure out the relationship between the two, mm -hmm. right? The separation um, and, and the togetherness. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, something I really have um, come to recognize from all my travels and being in very different places is that there's no connection without freedom, mm -hmm. and there's no freedom without connection. connection. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, so when we talk about community in that um, Feminist Freedom Warriors Project clip that you just saw, this is virtual, but it's also very real. So it's not a community that's you're talking about in abstract from what we do. It's a community that we are engaging in work together, right, across the board together and having a similar kind of vision of what community means that we share these things, anti-capitalism anti-imperialism, looking at justice, fighting for the underdogs always, and there's so many, including in the academy. And this together is what we mean by community. So it's not just a virtual space when we look at feminist freedom warriors, it is a coming together of these things as strategies that we use to organize, build, challenge, and so forth in the work that we do. What we have are, just for people who are not familiar, we have about one hour long conversations with almost 39 or 40 scholar activists from around the world. And across and, generations. And different generations and people who are located in different geographical spaces too and social movements. So please check it out. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you all again for sharing ways that we can safely, actively build and hold and strengthen community. And the ways we're also accountable to communities and to ourselves also as part of communities, right? Um, I'd like to now focus on a question for each of you that is relevant for your work. Please also feel free as Chandra and Linda have been doing to interact with one another in your remarks. Um, I'm going to start now with Darakshan and Tamara. I wanted to ask you both, what are the ways you feel that community-based research, community-generated knowledge, and community education can play a meaningful role in our movements for justice and in your work specifically? Darakshan, would you like to begin? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm happy to do that. I think uh, it's really important to remember that one of the ways that structures of uh, oppression and uh, power are able to sustain themselves is through knowledge, through research. Um, I know as someone who formerly worked at the Urban Institute, how much the think tank world um, was weaponized to silence community, to silence impacted people, to say that the real experts of experience are researchers, academics, typically not in accountability or in relationship or even from the community directly. So we have to remember that this is not somehow a neutral zone when we talk about knowledge production or data production or facts production. It's been weaponized and used against our communities always. So the power of community being able to dictate information about themselves is itself transformative. Um, again, so many times if you really see if a researcher or someone who is talking about a community is afraid to be in front of a community and talk, 
that should give you a red flag. They are afraid of being held accountable. Um, and so some of the ways that our work that we have done that, right, um, we do town halls. Town halls are very much to me like focus groups, right? You can get stories from community. They give you data themselves. And I know there's a lot in terms of, oh, this is quantitative versus qualitative. We got that hierarchy in the academy and research too. But there are still data points to pick from even qualitative research or qualitative work that we do. Um, and so I think that those are some ways, again, that for the community to have control over their own narrative is very integral. And then how that shapes where does policy shift? Where do resources go? What is also the story being told about a community? Um, again, often communities have very little control and power over that. And so I think those are some ways that that um, really supports movement work. Um, I would also say the historical documentation and record. Um, who gets to do that? You know, often we see that the stories of women, queer folks, right, people of color who have resisted are not always necessarily accessible. We see stories through the lens of like white colonizers who share, you know, we did a civilizing project. And so I think the documentation piece is really integral for movement folks as well, right? I know we're really busy organizing on the ground, but I think about some of the words of Miriam Kaba who talks about document your work, make sure it is accessible. Something earlier that, you know, Chandra was mentioning um, also in terms of like the the what is the historical record that we know about folks before us who've done the work that is really important for a movement and community to be aware of so that we don't make the same mistakes or that we learn some lessons right none of us are the first to do anything someone has already been doing it and I think what we can do is build some bridges through the knowledge to connect people so people know who to go to you know I, I really look at all these stories and interviews as like deep study for any movement organizer because through that, we have a lot of lessons and treasures that we can use in the work that we are doing right now. So I think, again, some ways that we're doing it, oral histories, I think make policy and research accessible to community. This is not too hard. Let's demystify it. Let's demystify the language about it. Let community understand that data information that is being put out so that community can challenge it and say, this is inaccurate. Where did you get this? You know, people coming in who don't even speak the language sometimes, have never been in the community before, are becoming experts in speaking. And so I think this entire power hierarchy needs to be shifted and we need to demystify and make it accessible and led by community. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yes, to being real and clear about who has control and who gets to speak and document and ask questions. Tamara, uh, would you like to continue? And again, you can respond uh, to that. Yeah. And also, should I repeat the question for you? Uh, no, it's fine. It's fine. I'll do, I'll do my take on it. Um, but yeah, no, I just wanted to thank Direction for that, and, and and a lot of what you spoke about, um, direction was what really kind of re resonates, and especially in terms of like two things, like you you spoke about demystifying and making things more accessible, and you spoke about um, that communities speaking for themselves is transformative. And I think again, obviously, I'm I'm very much in the Palestine space at the moment, and that that feels like it's really resonating right now. I mean, a big part of, in fact, we use those words in describing what we do sometimes at McCann, we use the word of demystifying and making accessible, right? Because so often when it comes to Palestine, Israel and, and other issues too, you know, it's like, it's too complex, you know, actually it's really complicated. It's really, let's not reduce it down to the bare bones. And, you know, and that's often used as an excuse uh, not to present the realities for for what they actually are and to actually put people off, whether deliberately or not, uh, from, from wanting to learn more, for, to make people feel like you have to be an expert or you have to be an academic or you have to have studied, um, you know, Middle East history to be able to speak out. Um, and of course, that's not the case. Um, so I, I really like that kind of angle of, you know, demystifying things and making them accessible to, to people. Um, and then I think, you know, what you spoke about, Direction, in terms of communities speaking for themselves being transformative, I think that's just precisely what's finally happening with Palestinians now. It's like, finally, people are giving them a platform to say what they've been trying to say, to say what we've been trying to say for decades. And it's transformative. It's transformative. We've seen the power of social media for all of its flaws and faults. We've seen the power of social media because it's been able to literally bring, you know, 
Palestinians who are being forced out of their homes in Sheikh Jarrah, like Muhammad al-Kurd and Muna al-Kurd and others, um, the power of people, especially young people who are using these social media tools to just hear that unedited, unadulterated content directly from the peer people who are experiencing the oppression themselves without it being framed, you know, within CNN or the BBC or the New York Times or whatever, um, has been so, so in incredibly powerful. Um, and I think it's really, um, that is what is kind of really contributing to shifting this moment after, of course, um, as you were saying, the decades of work, hard, you know, grit work that's been done by Palestinians and their allies, you know, whether they're scholar activists, whether they're academics, whether they're research institutes, you know, cultural workers, artists, filmmakers, to be able to chip away at this false narrative and to be able to produce their own knowledge and to produce their own content and to push their own voices out and to insist on narrating, you know, our stories and our experiences for, for ourselves. Um, so, you know, so I think what, I mean, coming back to the question for, for a moment in terms of, you know, how, how does community generated knowledge and education play a role in, in movements for justice? Um, I think, you know, there's obviously a need for these interventions, right? It's these community led and grassroots efforts and movements uh, that are needed precisely because communities like Palestinians, like other indigenous communities uh, around the world um, in settler colonial contexts uh, have been wiped off the map and wiped off the history books. Literally. <coughs> so if it weren't for these efforts, um, you know, it would be nearly impossible to try to work towards achieving some some kind of justice. So it's only because of these kinds of movements and efforts that people are now finally beginning to understand, right? And it applies also to the movement for black lives um, in the US and beyond that, you know, yes, people are understanding now that systematic and structural racism exists. It exists every day in the United States and in the UK and elsewhere, that deep-rooted daily misogyny and discrimination against women and, and, and gender non-binary people exists. Um, and, and similarly, that Palestinians have been colonized and dominated for decades through a settler colonial apartheid regime. And those are the words that are finally, you know, starting to reach kind of the ears of, of the mainstream. Mm -hmm. So I'll just end by saying that, uh, you know, people have to know that there's an injustice to be able to act on it. And uh, that knowledge, building that knowledge, creating that knowledge is, is building power. Mm -hmm. well, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, super beautiful. Clearly, we see the connection, right, between education and knowledge production and action, right? the power of narrating for ourselves and shifting the narrative and mm -hmm. towards action and change. Thank you. It's such a great example, both, what both of you have said, right? It's such a great example of what we are trying to do in democratizing knowledge. Wouldn't you say, Linda? I mean, it's literally exactly the kind of work that we're trying to do um, in different spaces, but specifically in democratizing knowledge. I mean, the whole idea of demystifying and rewriting hegemonic narratives, right? Um, that is crucial to anyone recognizing histories of colonialism, racism, mm -hmm. misogyny, all mm -hmm. of that, right? So if we didn't, if we weren't able to take apart those powerful normative narratives, the ones that seem like commonsensical to people, right, mm -hmm. all of the time. So in the case of Palestine, what has been profound, I think, in the last, you know, few years after a lot of organizing by BDS and others, right, but especially now with social media, as you said, but also really with um, the awareness of how um, state violence actually functions yeah. across borders, right? So after George Floyd, after uh, abolition not being a bad word in the US context, people actually know what it kind of means, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think that all of those have brought us to a historical place where some of this work is so, so important and is being heard in the ways that it was not being heard. 
before. We could talk till we were blue in the face, you know, but it was not being heard. Linda, you want to say something about DK and social media too? Yeah. That's our social media. Right. So this has been a significant organizing tool, you know, um, of building solidarity. As I listen to Tamara and Darakshan, I keep thinking that this could not have been done without those tools. And part of what we are doing in this academic setting of democratizing knowledge is telling the white supremacist educators that the days of that kind of education are done. We are going to talk about ourselves, our people, give legitimacy to that and challenge their unearned privileges in that space mm -hmm. that they have inherited and taken as their own so that we do more than say, for example, in our case of university, Syracuse University, that it's occupying First Nations land and these are the communities, but then we move on, right? Yeah. Because yeah, you have, do a land acknowledgement yeah. and you move on. Because they have done the acknowledgement thing. Yeah. And there is no engagement. There's no deconstruction of what that means. There's nothing about the buildings that sit on the bodies of those First Nations people. And so it's like an acknowledgement and we have done something for you. So can we move ahead now? But we're saying no. There is still fundamental injustice here because the legacy of that continues and you are part, the institutions are part of that legacy and we need to change those narratives because it's more than narratives, it's false history. It's been a falsifying of history. So we have to look at what the real facts are, what the truth is, and that's what we are trying to do from inside of the institution saying, you know, the days of going into the community objectifying people, doing the research, coming back and publishing it and having nothing that goes back to the community. No, we're not accepting that anymore. So what we have are organic intellectuals in the communities that will no longer speak to them. I have been part of that in Syracuse, New York. So there's a lot to say, you know, I mean, there's just, um, and we, one of the, uh, the examples we wanted to give you, we won't talk too much because it might be good to now have more of a, you know, in conversation practice. among all of us, but that we, we did a, a series of summer institutes called mm -hmm. Just Academic Spaces, okay, over three years. And it was basically a way to uh, connect people who were in higher education with community organizations within the spaces that we were in, right? So we did one in Syracuse, we did one at Spelman College, and we did one at Rutgers Newark. Very different institutional spaces, very different cities, right? And, uh, and the point was really to rethink what knowledge, what the knowledge is around questions of justice, right? Actually mean when you engage with people who are not just within your own little space, but mm -hmm. that you actually co-create knowledge, you work with community organizations, right, in order to learn from them and to engage with them. So mm -hmm. that knowledge then is something that is a collaborative effort and, and it isn't about hierarchies, right? So that and that was amazing. Those institutes were amazing. And what's mm -hmm. happened is that we have these kind of concentric circles. You know, people who came have gone on to do their own. Their mini, mini DK institutes. Their mini institutes, their yeah. mini, institutes, their yeah. mini organizing, yeah. their mini writing. Their you know, mini DKs in it. their institutions too. Many have started that work. So it's been really wonderful that way. So that's just one example. But I'll leave it at that and, you know, open to other questions. And Amazing. Well, we did have a specific question for the two of you. So maybe, I mean, you've already kind of gone into there, but if you want to spend one more minute just thinking about uh, before we move on to the questions from, from everybody else from the audience, um, really briefly, how do you think about which forms of expression you utilize and, and uplift? as you engage in your work and as you share and produce knowledge and stories and as you think about whose voices matter and why. And I would also say, I open that up to, to all of you also just for two minutes. 
Right. Well, we we talk about this all the time, and um, it's a, a language of understanding. It's about anti-capitalism. It's about um, anti-racism. So we cannot talk about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those are foreign, meaningless, and useless terms to us. It has to yeah. be. About, that's the you know what we call the latest industry in the academy, yeah. and that is absolutely useless. You mm -hmm. cannot go and listen to people talk about their pain and their anguish of being marginalized in the institutions every day and the hostility that they have to live with and work in a hostile environment and sit there as maybe the diversity officer and you say nothing, but you're doing the institution's work because you're the diversity officer and you're there. That is fundamentally problematic. So what we are training our students to understand is that that is dysfunctional that we cannot be part of those dysfunctional spaces without challenge. And that's what makes what we're doing justice projects. That's what makes it, because we are challenging those kinds of things. So the language for us that is unifying, that creates solidarity, it's around anti-capitalism, it's around anti-racism, it's around white um, supremacy. We have to call it what it is. We have to say what they are. Yeah. It's, yeah. you know, the the heteronormativity, the kinds of structural understandings of some people are marginalized, they're out there and we're talking about the others here. No, for us it's collective, it's collective work, it's collaborative work and it's unifying work. We have to be coming from the same space and place. And we have to be that accountable to each and you other. Must be accountable and sometimes that is uncomfortable, but you have to recognize that out of that discomfort comes change. If we're all comfortable and we're not using the language of challenge and to create change, then we are marching, you know, wasting time just marking time. Yeah, yeah. It's like Tamara, you were saying earlier, right? If you don't speak up, if you don't speak up, right? And if if there isn't, uh, it, it, if you don't take a risk, right? It Nothing really changes, but you can't also, and this is where I think this idea of community is so significant, you also have to be strategic in how you take risks. Therefore, you need your peeps with you. You need those people standing next to you and behind you who have your back, right? And who, who have the courage, the who have the to courage to, who have the courage, you got your peeps, they're at your back, but they have the courage so yeah. that when you are being attacked, they are being attacked too. They see it as an attack on them. Yeah. And that's what solidarity work is about. Yeah. And it's about uh, accountability to each other and taking a risk and not pretending you're the same. Mm -hmm. We can never really do that. Mm -hmm. So difference really matters, but what matters through that difference is having a vision of solidarity and justice that you share. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, to me, that's like the deepest part of why community matters and the kinds of communities, justice communities we build are so important in changing the narrative, in changing structures, hierarchies. In helping to understand that we all occupy a similar and sometimes same location. Yeah. Thank you. This is so important. And, you know, the, the thank you also for like that really important language shift like about false histories. Like, absolutely right. This is not some abstraction, this is real, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's so like gonna... we are trained to propagate. Yeah. And if you recognize that, and people in the physical communities tell you that. Uh -huh. you know, they'll tell you this. You know, that institution, it has nothing to do with us. We're right down the hill, but et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah. they understand. So we cannot continue to fool ourselves that they don't understand and that what we are doing is really some incredible work on their behalf and for their good yeah. an insult yeah absolutely so we have time for a few questions and um i'm just gonna open up to all right one question is and and really anybody can can answer can begin with a response. Um, COVID-19 highlighted the injustices upon women and ageism, domestic and globally. How can we make sure this does not happen in the future?
Well, we can start by calling the powers that be to accountability. In the United States, for example, we have people who are elected not to rule. That's what they assume their roles are. Mm -hmm. You know, elect me not to govern you. So we talk about no, no tax increases, no, um, you know, challenging the kinds of structures that are inherently and fundamentally, you know, oppressive to the vast majority of people, but they are the elected folks. So we have to hold people accountable. Yeah, thank This you. is a job that we have given you and you work for the community, you work for us. Mm -hmm. So that's a start. I also point. think, uh, I also think that, uh, you know, once we learn certain things, once we know certain things, we can't unknow them mm -hmm. unless we work really hard at it. Yeah. So if COVID-19 has actually exposed gender and other inequities, which I think it really has, it's made it transparent in so many ways, people who do not want to pay attention to that have to work really hard to not pay attention to that and to address it. So one thing I would say is that this has been one of the ways in which um, power hierarchies have been um, made transparent. So now it's up to us what we do with it, yeah? And there are a lot of think tanks, right? Mm -hmm. Ready to rewrite that narrative. So one thing to be vigilant about, and this is what I think political education is, is really at its core. You cannot allow people to forget. No. We cannot forget certain things, right? We have to be vigilant about how the narratives are being rewritten as, as we struggle against them. Think about what's happening around Palestine now and you can really see, yeah, that on the one hand, there's a lot of transparency about an apartheid state, about, you know, this, that, and the other. On the other hand, there's all kinds of stuff I see on the edges of people saying, no, but it's too complicated. No, but, you know, um, what about Israel? What about anti-Semitism? All of the stuff that gets thrown in, right? And those of us on campus know how organized a lot of these spaces are and funded really well. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I'd stop. Yeah. I'd stop no. forever. <laughs> but we are building from that. So another question and comment for us, beautiful and inspiring conversation. Many of our educational institutions actively negate community and care as described here. How does one build community in such hostile places? Someone well, you first build critical mass. In the hostile space, you build critical mass. It is the key tool to organizing. Mm -hmm. The kind of change that you envision, you build critical mass. You find people who have similar ideas or thoughts or share, and you can find them. Not in an abundance, but it just takes a few to start. You build critical mass. There's nothing you can do on your own or by yourself. So you have to, you know, that's a principle that one has to learn. And when you do that, then, you know, it gets larger and larger. And, and with small groups, you can do a lot. We have done a lot in DK, and we've never been 15 people, never. No. Never even been 12 at any given time. No, no. Mm -mm. Always less than 10. Yeah. But you all, your, the way you, each of you speak about your organizations, that is an example of how you build thing. critical mass. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. you all are not in the, you may not be in the academy, but you're in very hostile spaces. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no two ways about that, right? Building critical mass, it's a real key organizing tool. And that's what we taught the young faculty who came to Just Academic Spaces Institutes. We taught them so much of that. When you go back to your home institutions, build critical mass. Can I, can I build from that and also see if anybody has would like to respond to that? Just push it a little bit to, to ask how. What are some of the ways that you have found building critical mass has either been effective or worked? 
I mean, I think, uh, sorry, I'll jump in. I think that's actually a question. I don't have an answer to it. I think that's actually a question that a lot of us now kind of in the in the Palestine movement are asking ourselves because there's suddenly this like renewed interest and kind of more people wanting to engage, more people wanting to learn, more people wanting to get involved. And so I think, and, and I, and I it, it seems to me certainly in the UK and, and I, I think in the US as well that with, you know, the movement for black lives and, um, you know, all the incredible street protests that took place last year, there was a, a massive influx of kind of interest and understanding and awareness building that that wasn't there around kind of you know racial uh injustice and how systemic it is and and there is that question mark um and i'd love to hear more from others here about around how do you capture those people in that moment where there's suddenly this like you know hurricane in the best way possible that like people want to get involved and where you have you know organizations certainly like ours that are you know pretty small and at, at pretty limited capacity so how you know how how do you capture those people I and mean, of course there are ways i mean in i'll use a, a very simple kind of banal uh, example now i mean the workshops we do traditionally are you know pretty intense political education history um international law workshops um, aimed at people who are already, you know, activists or campaigners or, or aspiring activists and campaigners uh, on some level. And now that we see there's kind of a new moment, at least for now, that's happening, we're trying to make that a lot more accessible. So it's not just for people who are um, already in the movement, so to speak. So it's trying to make Palestine, again, what we were talking about earlier, Chandra and Direction, about making things accessible and demystifying and really inviting people to, to, to not feel kind of embarrassed. Like, you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be an academic. Like, you just need to be interested. You just need to be curious. And so I think one of the ways, at least from our sense as an educational organization, is to create those spaces um, to welcome broader kind of range um, uh, of people. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'd love to hear more from others on this too. I'm gonna keep on going with the questions because more are coming in. And um, a question is, are there gaps identified through the use of surveys or are there other p ways to engage impacted people in the collection of meaningful data? And if there's time, could there be further discussion on the collection of oral histories? Well, that's a methodology question. We did not, um, in doing the FFW project, the surveys that we talked about, we simply found the easiest means. Remember, we were doing this with no funding whatsoever, no mm -hmm. resources. So we found the easiest means to reach a mass of people that we knew. And so it was sending them a survey was the easiest method and then we coded those responses when they came back and we found the trends and patterns that's how we did that so it was very scientific but we knew all the people and we you know still we wanted to see the patterns and trends in the responses so that was the methodological tool so it wasn't is this accurate and is this not accurate no we're talking about people's genealogical histories and their experiences you know as feminist activists activist scholars and so on, what they are doing. So it was a very, very, very useful, extremely effective tool of doing that. Mm -hmm. But of course there are gaps in, in almost all forms. Any kind of collection, any methodology. there's no question that there will be gaps. The question is, even with the gaps, what, what is the value of the work that we are doing? So when we talk about the, the fact that we need to be creating knowledge and histories, oral histories, uh, from the location, from the point of view of those communities that have not been written into normative or hegemonic histories, there Getting is very there particular is reason for doing that. There's a very particular reason. Yeah. We are, in fact, being selective. Mm -hmm. And it is bloody well important to be selective in this context. And we are also claiming that these oral histories, for instance, with Darakshan talking about the voices of Muslim women in very particular contexts, right? Those voices are really, really important because they give us knowledge, right, about experience, history, and critical understanding of power mm -hmm. that people who are not in that community 
do not have. Mm -hmm. Okay, so part of it is yes, a lot of the knowledges we create are partial, but that doesn't mean they're not valuable. And part of the questioning here is what are we producing knowledges for? Who are we producing them for? Uh, what interest does the knowledge serve? Right. And what do we mean when we talk about partial knowledge or essentialist knowledge? Or what, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. That is oftentimes the language of the hegemonic frame. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those who have had all the privilege never deconstruct their privilege, never look at themselves otherwise. There is no value neutral knowledge. None. Mm -hmm. All right. There is no methodology that doesn't have flaws. And we no longer think, doesn't matter how we've been trained, we will not feel guilty for being selective. So we choose the people that we want to engage for a particular vision of community. And there is no, there's no bias in that. Because when you read it, you see that their voice is across the spectrum. But who says and why should we continue to believe that, you know, knowledge that's created in this, supposedly in this atmosphere of neutrality, has more validity than what we are creating. There is no value neutral knowledge, none. Yeah, I think following up on that, um, the question around who's your audience is very much key. Um, when we are collecting oral histories or surveys with impacted community members, mm -hmm. we're not always thinking about a white dominant uh, audience. That's not always the focus. Absolutely. Sometimes it's us. We are the focus. Mm -hmm. uh, what does it mean to uh, gather stories by our people for our people? What mm -hmm. is the healing, uh, pro right? What is the healing impact of that? I think about the oral histories we did with Muslim workers and to talk to workers and hear from them that, hey, no one has ever asked for our stories. Like we've mm -hmm. lost so much in our communities because we're always thinking about what is going to be for the mainstream dominant, let's say white, communities really that's what we mean when we say mainstream because we're not thinking about other communities of color or even our own communities it's always about for power how can we make our narratives palatable i don't really care because frankly we've had those palatable narratives and it still hasn't shifted anything about our communities i mean for so many years the narratives from muslim communities were about we are palatable american citizens so let's make us friendly to the american general public that didn't do anything for the expansion of the war on terror. Right. Our people still got bombed and droned and still got banned, right? So I think like there comes a point where why are we always focused on the dominant mainstream white audiences? What about our own community? What about stories that are never told? Again, right. we need to hear from Muslim workers like that in itself was transformational. And I'm excited mm -hmm. to see how these stories and projects are going to be like what does it mean for our community to have space to just have our own stories for us? Why is it always about somebody external that we have to like shift and change and humanize ourselves? Um, and that goes to also in the data collection part about impacted stories. I really appreciate what like Linda mentioned, there's no such thing as objectivity or the high standard of research. Again, mm -hmm. worked in a research like think tank for four years. It was all white people doing research on people of color. Nobody ever questioned that. So mm -hmm. again, I think that there are ways that like there's no such thing as objective, perfect research. And we don't always have to think about audiences outside of our community. Sometimes it's for us and that's OK and that's powerful. And we don't have to defer to those communities to legitimize our communities. Mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time training students about that, graduate students. We have to talk about everything in feminism that came before our feminism. Our feminism has been there. You are part of creating it. Do it without guilt and anything else. That you do not have to defer to make that knowledge the other, rather than we are always trying to come out from under the other ring. We done with that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. We have a bunch of other questions that we are not going to be able to get to because I do want to give you all just a moment uh, if you have uh, any closing remarks that any of you would like to make because we are coming really to the end of this program. Mm. It's too um, soon. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I said it's too soon. To mm -hmm. end. I agree. I found the conversation rejuvenating mm -hmm. because so many times you find yourself censoring yourself with so many moments of rage with the injustice that we find ourselves immersed in every day. And the moments like these are rare, 
And so I personally find it rejuvenating. I mean, I have been cussing my TV and, you know, because you have to get it out somewhere, right? But when you have moments like these, you recognize that there are so many of us who have shared experiences from very different backgrounds, shared experiences, collectivities of sameness, understandings of sameness. And where does that come from? That comes from that white hegemonic frame of knowledge construction we must continue to deconstruct and disavow and put aside. Yeah, um, totally. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I just wanted to say I was so wrapped up in what in what Linda was saying. Honestly, I've lost my train of thought completely. Um, no, it's been I've really, yeah, I found it really rejuvenating too, actually, and just like, yeah, also like healing on some level. Um, um, and I think, and, and it's actually, you know, I have to say, it's also been really nice to be like in a, in a female space. There's also just something about that. That's just, you know, just special. It is, you know, um, and, and I just wanted to kind of, um, what Derek Shan, what you were talking about before, you know, in terms of like, why, why do we always just have to do things like for the, you know, for the mainstream, the white dominant kind of mainstream narrative that really, really resonates. And again, it's just so relevant to Palestine and to so many other things. And, and I think that's really what's exciting about what we're seeing now is that I think people are just like, screw this. I'm just going to tell it like it is. And I'm going to tell yeah. it for myself and I'm going to tell it for my people and, and whoever else wants to listen great and if you don't want to listen fine and I think that that's telling it to our people is like that's such a powerful thing that you said and 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 that's also about building collective and building critical mass because if you if you empower one another and you start to build each other's confidence and your own comf confidence and uplift one another you know and set the standards higher and push the boundaries and constantly push them and and break them mm -hmm. um then I think that's where the that's where the real work can happen. So yeah, and I just want to thank everyone, and it's been a real pleasure to be here with you all. Um, so maybe one day in real life. <laughs> yes, inshallah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So I believe we are adding some links in the chat box of just some of the many organizations that are working in the U.S. on issues of justice in pa Palestine. So uh, mm -hmm. you can check that out, and I. Also wanted to mention that Parseo is partnering with Project 48 uh, in developing the Palestinian Nakba curriculum, which mm -hmm. through texts and visuals and archives and personal accounts uh, offers an opportunity to learn about the Nakba, both historically and ongoing. And that website will be available soon. Thank you so, Can so- I one minute? Oh, yes. I, want to, I just wanted to say that, you know, it's interesting. I think we created a little collective space here which was really, really important. And mm -hmm. so in some ways, it's a good good uh, example of what it takes, yeah, is to be able to be on the same page mm -hmm. and to be in solidarity and to hear each other mm -hmm. and to add um, ways of thinking onto what each other has said. And so I really deeply appreciate this, the space and, and you all. And, and to understand that as an empowerment. Yeah. Uh, we all leave feeling more empowered. This is a tool of empowerment that we yeah. create here. Yeah, and you know, if I could just very quickly plug one thing since we are talking about academic spaces. So Justice for Muslims Collective, Heart and Vigilant Love, we're actually doing an institute next weekend, which is focused around gendered Islamophobia and the academy. So if you are someone who is Muslim or racialized as Muslim or work in the academic space, it is a free space. Um, so please definitely check out our website or follow us or whatever if you're interested in attending this one day um, institute that is going to be really focused on gendered Islamophobia and the academic space. So just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Yeah, I really, I feel all of what you're saying. I feel like I'm in community with you. I feel rejuvenated. I feel like, uh, not like how I usually feel during <laughs> these kinds of conversations. So. <laughs> That's a really big thing. And really, thank you all for sharing your wisdom. And thank you to Haymarket for hosting this panel with us. Yeah. 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 All right. yes. yeah. And many thanks to everyone who joined us. We look forward to yes, continuing this you. conversation. Folks who actually listened. Yes. Yeah.
<laughs> yes, and joining in, in our work for justice together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank this you. Lovely. Bye. <laughs>